Last Child in the Woods came out, and there's a similar audience, and Janice and Ron Swaysko that you're going to meet here uh, were in the audience. And I ran into uh, uh, Ron at Starbucks, and he recognized me. I was harassing the barista and, uh, you know, not doing nice things. And he, uh, he introduced himself, and he said, I saw you the other night, and he and Janice since then, started a family nature club, which is something that the Joel Nature Network has been promoting for quite a while. And today they have over 1,500 families in their family nature club. So thanks. of the Children and Nature Movement, or 
as I say, the new nature movement because it does include adults, might want to ask. No easy answers here, but here's something to consider. Cultural movements are diminished when they become too professionalized, too dependent on programs and experts who sometimes obscure the original passion with opaque language, their own language. Or on policy debates. These are important to, pursue, to, to the pursuit of change, but they're not the goal. When movements fail to enter our everyday lives and become contagious on a personal family level, when they don't do that, they lose their grassroots energy. Will the children in nature movement follow that pattern? I don't think so, but I'm not sure. Government or large institutions alone cannot create a nature-rich civilization. A long-lived movement requires the rapid contagion of small actions taken daily by individuals, families, churches, schools, grandparents, and many others. Actions encouraged by, but not dependent, on organizations, programs, public policies, and experts. The key ingredient for our movement's longevity will be to build on the public awareness that has grown rapidly over the past decade and more, but to move faster toward showing people how to take action now at the individual, family, and community levels. What we need most is self-replicating cultural change. That happens when individuals, families, or small groups of people take the kinds of actions so enticing that other people want to replicate them. Putting nature time on the family calendar or taking a break from electronics or learning how to develop our super senses, as I explained in vitamin N, in nature, are a few of the hundreds of steps we can take. Creating a family nature club is another, like Rod and Jazz and Heather. There's now over 200 of them in the United States, many of them with hundreds of families and members. Using blog pages, social networking sites, and the old-fashioned instrument called the telephone, or now the smartphone, families are reaching out to other families to create virtual clubs that arrange multi-family hikes and other nature activities. Uh, hundreds have downloaded Actually, thousands now have downloaded the free CNN Troll Nature Network toolkit that teaches them how to learn how to create a family nature club. This is also in vitamin N. One such club, as I just mentioned, is San Diego's with over 1,500 families. Their lives have been changed. These parents aren't waiting for funding or permission. They're doing it themselves now. Of course, we need the commitment and action of large organizations and institutions and government through Cities Connecting Children and Nature, Children and Nature Network, and the National League of Cities are now encouraging some 19,000 mayors and other municipal leaders to help make their communities nature rich. One of those communities, I hope, will be in San Diego County. Maybe it will be San Diego itself, or it's Nita's, or one of the other cities, uh, maybe one city here will decide to become the best city, maybe the finest city in America for children in nature. We'll talk about that more later, but essentially what I mean by that is a city, maybe led by a mayor, who we invited tonight. There are some city officials from around the county here and have, have a convening where lots of organizations and government set some goals. In two years, we're going to have this many pediatricians prescribing nature. It's already happening in Washington, D.C. and many other places. We're going to have this many schools with natural play spaces and, and natural playgrounds and gardens. We're going to have this many community gardens in inner cities. Uh, we're going to have this many family nature clubs, and on and on, and schools that commit themselves to this. And then, in a couple of years, go down that list of goals that we've set, and if we've met them, give ourselves an award. <laughs> Announce that we're the finest city in America for children and nature. 
And if some other, and make it part of our marketing DNA, you know? And if some other mayor objects to that, says, no, we are, that's good. That means it's contagious. That means competition. Um, we need charismatic ideas, not only charismatic leaders. Here's one idea about growing, with growing residents. The greeting of schools may represent the real cutting edge of education. To some, that statement is unexpected. But wait, isn't technology supposed to be the cutting edge? And a bit contrary, it also happens to be true. At least I believe it is. Uh, last Wednesday, uh, I think it was Wednesday, the, the CBS This Morning uh, show, they had had me go out to Atlanta and they uh, videotaped a segment, it was a four minute segment, about a school uh, that has, uh, serves lower income kids. And those kids get outside a third of the day. They do their math lessons in the woods around the school. They are the healthiest kids in that county of all of the schools, all of the elementary schools. This is, these are low-income kids in the poor section of the county. They're also, this school also has uh, the highest rate of improvement in academics of any school, including the rich schools in the whole county. This is happening all over the country and uh, in bits and pieces. But we can, I think, uh, make education understand eventually that for every dollar we invest on the virtual, we ought to invest at least another dollar on the real, particularly if it's major. Achieving that vision begins with individual action. A single teacher who insists on taking students outside to learn can change a school. The thousands of networked, what we call natural teachers, can transform education. Working with parents, they can make real the vision of a natural playground or garden at every school, of schools that invest as much in the real, as I said, as they do in the virtual. This is the power that each of us has. One family, by connecting to the natural world, can make a difference for generations to come. One library can plant the seeds for nature libraries across the country, ones that connect families to nature, that check out backpacks with local guides to the local bioregion and the animals and the plants of that region, and binoculars. In Albany, uh, they check out, from the libraries, they check out fishing rods. Libraries can become hubs of bioregional awareness. This is particularly important and possible in San Diego. We have more endangered species, more species in this county than any county in the United States. And most of us don't even know it. What if our libraries became, as I say, uh, hubs of regional uh, awareness about this bioregion? What if we made, gave this bioregion, which extends into in the northern Bob, a name and made it part of our marketing community? It's a remarkable uh, region, and libraries, as well as the Natural History Museum and others, can make a big difference in that regard. One pediatrician who prescribes vitamin M can lead to an international network of pediatricians who do the same. I'll talk about one pediatrician who has organized all the pediatricians in Washington, D.C. a little later along that line. They are prescribing nature. One artist who shares the beauty of the natural world with others could lead to a natural artist network. On a single inner city block, inner city residents can restore a patch of wildness or create a community garden and feed an entire city's spirit. Think of the difference that one faith-based organization could make if it committed to offering people a little vitamin M for the soul and then reached out to other churches, synagogues, and mosques. We need a network of mentoring grandparents and grandfriends who remember what it's like to build a fort or dip their toes in a stream or look up at the clouds and dream of the future, who do not want to take those memories with them 
when they leave this earth and who commit to passing them on to the next generation. We need a broader definition of green jobs and an international career guide to connecting people to nature. We need to make real Doug Talamy's charismatic idea, the creation of, home, of a homegrown national park, or better yet, a worldwide homegrown park, rich in native plants and revived biodiversity, beginning in each of our own yards. We can make this dream real and lasting and alive, one seed at a time. That's what many of you have already begun. You've already begun planting that future. Thank you.
Uh, since then, there have been studies that have shown that five minutes in a natural setting has an immediate psychological benefit to anybody who's walking through woods or whatever. And there are a few other studies, and probably some that are going on, that are trying to quantify that. Uh, I don't. I'm a little suspicious of studies that try to make it into a literal uh, pill. Um, you know, that, that is quantifiable, that is measurable, because there are so many variables. I mean, what's the weather like? Uh, uh, what kind of woods? What kind of desert? How hot? You know, I think there's too many variables to really come. So, I still say what I said 10 years ago, which is some is better than none, and more is better than some. Well, there's, there's, there's a sense, of course, in the title that you know, this is something that's, that's good for us. And, um, and I think uh, that's something that, that we all, uh, that resonates strongly with us. And I think uh, putting this together in, in this fashion, in this book, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's more of a how-to book this time. This is your prescriptive book. And I have a question about that as well. As well. What does it say about the state of affairs in our society today? that we need a how-to manual uh, to connect to nature? Uh, some people aggressively say that in reviews. <laughs> um, you know, because if we weren't, uh, you know, when, when Last Child in the Woods came out, you know, I was doing the research, and I knew that this was not on the front burner of our cultural conversation. Uh, we have been, you know, if, there, there's a gap in awareness as well as a gap in reality. When you look at the statistics of how little time kids spend today than they did, you know, 30, 40 years ago, it's astonishing. And it's not just the United States. And by the way, that film that was showing of the, the kid crawdadding and the kid tormenting his little brother with, with a crawdad, <laughs> that was me doing the tormenting. <laughs> We had, a, we had a couple of films that we wanted to show that the sound wouldn't work. Um, uh, there is a recent study in uh, the UK that found that kids in the United Kingdom spend less time outdoors than prisoners in the prison. There's some evidence that that is true in the United States as well. But what does it say? What does it say when we have schools, beginning in the 70s, they started designing schools with no windows. Uh, they don't do that anymore, but what they do now is cancel recess and cut field trips. They're a thing in the past most of the time. And they lengthen the school day, and they lengthen the school year, and they sit kids in front of computers. Now, I'm not anti-tech. I believe the more high-tech we become, though, the more nature we need. It's a kind of equation. And uh, I think that we're creating an environment in our schools that is disturbing to me. Not all schools. And I'm not talking about teachers here. I know teachers are a very good audience for this issue now. They weren't so much 10 years ago. But today, teachers are on top of this. And uh, that school that I think I mentioned, the CBS, did I mention the CBS? There's one little kid in that school who said the kids are the best part of that, that piece, by the way. You can look it up on CBS this morning. Uh, one kid told his teacher, uh, he was six years old, he just got back from uh, a hike outside the school, and he came back in and he said, Miss Miller, there's so much nature out here. I've only got two eyes and one brain, and I think I'm going to explode. <laughs> now, when's the last time you heard that kind of statement? You know, in a school, and it happens, I know. Teachers are doing their damage. They're, they're, they're really up against a lot. But, you know, there's a whole section in vitamin N on the senses, the super senses. And I found over time that kids want to know about this. They want to know about all these superpowers they have that they don't know they have. The scientists who study the human senses no longer talk about five senses. They talk conservatively about ten senses. And as many as 30 human senses. Uh, we have some of the ability of bats to use echolocation. We have the ability to track through the woods, a trail, just everything else covered. Um, we have a kind of sixth sense of study that the military has studied this in Afghanistan and Iraq. 
some soldiers know there's something down that alley and they shouldn't go down there, and others don't. And the study has shown that the, the soldiers who, who sense that come from two places, tough inner city neighborhoods and rural areas where they're outside. Um, one uh, man who I met who teaches people how to become the, the uh, pilots of cruise ships told me he gets two kinds of students. One kind uh, grew up in couches playing video games and all of that. And he said, those students have a talent I really need and skill because I have a lot of electronics on my ships. He said, the other kind of student grew up more outside. He said, that kind of student also has an ability that I need. That kind of student can actually sense where the ship is. He wasn't being facetious. So they, got, and they have, have, have developed their spatial senses more than the kids on the couch. And they can tell them that they're too close to God. He said his ideal student would be a student who has both sets of abilities. Both the abilities that come from virtual and the abilities that come from the real. And, and the nature principle, I have a whole section in this book about the hybrid mind. I think that should be one of the, the goals of uh, modern education. But instead, what our skills and schools are still moving toward is less and less time outdoors, less and less reality in their education, more and more uh, time in front of screens. And there's a reason for this. The people who are really in charge of the education debate, and I'm an agnostic about Common Core, I'm not talking about Common Core. The, real, the people who are really in charge are the tech companies because they have product to move. Uh, understandable. They want to sell their, their, their product in the schools. And they know exactly what kind of school they want in the future. It's filled with computers, but more than that, it's filled with video games. They're actually planning this, used as teaching tools. Not only that, but they say without much sense of embarrassment, they talk about something called stealth monitoring. And they say the good news is that testing as we know will fade away not so good, at least to make news, is that we won't need it anymore because every keystroke that a child makes all day in school and then when they get home on any device will be measured, quantified, and watched. It's worse. There's a story in the New Yorker a month ago about a school, high-tech school in Brooklyn. It has no playground. It's the elementary school. No playground. No outdoor time. And kids are watched. Literally, the walls have bubble, they have, they have um, uh, fisheye cameras on all the walls, watching these kids, analyzing them all the time. So what are we doing? You know, one thing we're doing, I think, this is what it comes down to, I'm sorry for the long speech, but this is the most important thing. I talk a lot about physical health, mental health, cognitive function, and all those things that are all helped by time and nature. But what we're really doing is um, we're creating environments for kids and ourselves in which our kids and we are spending more and more and more of our time trying to block out as many of those 30 senses as we can so we can focus on that screen and allegedly go anywhere in the world through the internet. I'm not anti-tech. But if our kids and we are spending so much time blocking out all these senses, many of which we don't even know we have. Isn't that the very definition of being less alive? Now, what parent wants their child to be less alive? What teacher wants their students to be less alive? Less alive? But I, don't know. I think most teachers, most parents, when they begin to think about this, they want to change that. But it's tough to know how. Well, that's, um, you've touched on this theme, and, uh, and so to shift gears a little bit, because that was a little bit depressing. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but uh, and actually, this was my next question. Can I, can I answer? There, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to end it on that note, that, that mantra that <laughs> is, um, there is a force that can stand up. There's no economic force that can stand up to the technical companies who are doing what they should do, trying to move problem. There's no economic force. 
And that's why it's so dominant. But the technology people know better. Steve Jobs did not let his kids play with iPads. He was a little kid. Um, it's amazing how many uh, tech leaders in Silicon Valley have cabins up in the off the grid, up in the mountains, that they go to recharge themselves. They know about this, but they don't talk about it. I want them to be the leaders, of, uh, some of the leaders of the children nature movement. And in fact, the school I visited in Atlanta was started by the guy who set up Howard Dean's internet campaign many years ago, and then did Obama's, and then worked at the White House as one of his tech experts for six, uh, six months, and then left, frustrated. He came home to Georgia and he created a school that gets kids outdoors. And he still drives a Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> yes, are we out of time? Hello. <laughs> um, yeah. You're not out of time, but at this point, we do want to invite up a few other people that are going to give you a perspective. Um, Rich had the idea, and we thought it was a great one to have some parents come up and um, also, well, they're all parents actually. So this time, I, uh, but we also have another special guest. So Pauline Jimenez um, is a mom of two young boys. Gita Asuri is a mom of is a mom of two young girls, and they um, they are part of our family nature club here. And Chris Redfern is also a parent of one young daughter, and he is also the executive director of San Diego Audubon Society. So thank you for joining us at this time for the panel. <laughs> So Rich, we'll have to, I'll have to ask you that hope question later, because that was my next question. But, uh, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll start with, with you, Chris, and uh, you know, we're fellow conservation biologists here, so we can bond over that. But uh, so, as, so you, you head a, a, a wildlife, local wildlife conservation organization, and so my question is, how does the goals of getting kids outside fit into your organization's strategies to restore habitats and protect and recover endangered species? Right, thank you. Um, so, a lot of environmental organizations do spend a lot of their time and energy um, doing what I would, I would call playing defense. So, we're looking at um, the threats that local wildlife and habitats are, are facing, and we're looking at ways to fight against those threats in a kind of reactive sort of way. And I think that, um, you know, to be effective, we've got to kind of work both offense, uh, both defense and offense, you know, to use a sports analogy. I think um, for us, for San Diego Audubon, um, the work that we do with children in nature is an investment, is, is a more long-term investment in really looking at trying to make a systemic change in our communities. You know, we have a, a vision of developing a culture of conservation that is, so that, we, you know, if we think about the environmental movement, um, the, the, the total funding that comes to the environmental movement is about 4% of all giving in the United States, 4%. So we all think that we have this big community here, but we're actually very small. Um, we're, we're kind of a side issue to, for the rest of the country. And so I think for us to really make um, the type of progress we need, we need more people in, under our tent. And so for, for us, um, being able to build the political um, power that we need, um, we need more um, natural teachers, more family adventure clubs. We need more people that are going to advocate for what we, we believe in. So we see the, the work we're doing with children as essential um, to the long-term success of our mission and, and to environmentalism as a whole. Fantastic. Yeah, I have, I have a stump speech that I give to other conservation biologists at, at, at conferences, et cetera, about how, you know, so we are, we're the ones who are involved in, in studying nature and preserving nature. And if we're not going to be the advocates for kids getting outside of nature, people getting outside of nature, where are we going to get our next generation of conservation professionals from? Um, because, you know, John Muir didn't grow up, you know, doing this, right? So we need to, um, we, we need to reach out um, and we're the ones who should have the passion and the ability to connect to people in this regard. So, thank you, Chris. So, Pauline. So, you're a member of our Family Nature Club, uh, Family Adventures in Nature, 
And uh, I just wanted to know, you know, your personal perspective on what it's meant to you and your family to be in a family nature club and, and how, has, how has it changed the way you interact with nature? What advantages does it have for you? Thank you, Ron. Um, we've been part of the group for, I think, about four years now. I was talking with Cham. Um, when my oldest is eight now, he was about four, and my little one was about one. And um, it's been wonderful, especially, I think, having, I mean, for any children, but in particular, I think, for boys, it's even particularly important for them to get out and just be able to let out that physical energy. Um, my son loves climbing trees. Um, we've gone camping with the group several times. We've gone on several hikes. One particular um, memory I have is my little one was about two, I just turned two. We did a fairly long hike in Vulcan Mountain with you guys. And we got, we went all the way up. It was foggy. We came back down. We found ladybug nests along the way. We saw a hawk's nest. And he walked a long way, and I carried him some of the way down. When we got home, the first thing he says, he said, Moss hike in sign language. He wants more. He wanted more hike, more hike. He was just two. So that was really neat. I just see them so happy when we've gone camping. My oldest one thanks me. Those are the times I really remember them. Not, you know, when we've gone to Disneyland or done other things. But he says, Mommy, thank you so much for bringing me camping. And it's just the simple things, you know, just allowing them to run, to be free. Um, there's not as many boundaries, just go, you know, run around and play and get dirty and pick up rocks and explore. And that's what it's meant to us. Thank you, fantastic. Well, that, that story, those stories right there explain exactly why Janice and I do what we do, because it's hearing those stories. Um, for you guys and how it's meaningful in your lives that motivates us to do this. I know one of the most common things I say when we get back from a, a, a hike or a camping trip is I look over at Janice and say, we did a good thing. So, thank you for letting us do a good thing. Thank you for allowing us to be part of this and now spread it onward as well. So Gita, so um, I know that you have been reading vitamin N and as, as a mother and to someone who, you know, naturally appreciate, appreciates nature, what, are, what is your, what important takeaway messages do you have from, from this book? There was so many things that resonated with me. It was, you know, um, it's a prescriptive book, so there were a lot of ideas and, you know, for a while I was writing down the ones that made sense and then I was like, I just, you know, I just have to stop writing. I just have to flip the book open. And Seven point three lifetimes. I'm finding something. But I think one of the things that kind of comes to mind immediately is, you know, when when kids think about science or schools think about science, we're sometimes talking about books, reading about dinosaurs, finding out about exotic plants that grow in the Amazon. That's one part of it. But going out into your backyard, being in kind of, this is you know the biome that you live in, experiencing the natural plants, the flora and fauna of San Diego County, which is outside your doorstep, connects, is so much more real to children. That's what, because they're, they're um, view of the world is experiential. It doesn't come from books. It comes from what they can touch and feel and smell and hear. So having all those ideas at our disposal to kind of connect with what they live in is so much more meaningful for them. So it was, it's, I think that, that really, um, to kind of see that idea and, you know, as part of the, fam uh, the nature club, to go out with other families and have these ideas kind of in all our heads um, is going to make it much more enriching for, for us and for our families. So, um, I don't know what I'm supposed to do next because I, <laughs> I can't see my boss. Uh, but uh, I think I, I know what I'd like to do next and that's you know, give Rich a chance to, to speak to our guest. It's not on the agenda, but um, if you had some some questions or comments that you guys have? One, one question, and this is kind of a corrective thing. I don't want to, I really, I know I said I wasn't anti-tech. I'm not talking about uh, pushing back at schools to get rid of computers at all. You know, 
they're part of our lives, technology. I'm at my computer a lot. You know, I publish this today on the computer. Uh, I love my iPhone too much. Uh, so I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a force that stands up for balance. Not just, not necessarily 50-50. Actually, I think it should be more nature than, than virtual. But, but to stand up for that, there is no lobby in America, certainly not in education, that will stand up for that kind of balance between the real and the virtual in a forceful way. There's no economic group that can do that. There's a social movement that can. And it's you. It's the people in this room, and tens of thousands of people like you all across the country. And now I spend more time in other countries as well. It's happening there, too. This is the force for balance in this room. And we don't maybe need necessarily another economic force to, to stand up for balance because we have you. Well, since no one's asking me to, to shut up, I'll keep talking. Um, the, uh, the question I did want to ask um, after your last uh, comment was, um, you know, one of the things that uh, it really drew me to this movement was, and we've talked about this a lot, was this sense of hope. You know, it's you know, on the one hand, you know, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of bad things happening. There's a lot of there's a lot of trends that we're very unhappy with and dissatisfied with. But on the other hand, I think this is something that's grown through time with this movement that, that you've catalyzed, and that is um, and that is a sense of hope and a, and a sense of ability. Uh, for our actions to make a difference and actually help bring about a, a better world. And so the, the question then is if you can comment on that or and but also you know what you know what is our empirical evidence for hope that we have from the last ten plus years since last child? What's changed? What's what, what are we are we on the right path in some areas here? Um, I, well I you know as soon as I, I I want to say something larger about that, but um, after I speak briefly, hopefully, I'd like to find out what creates hope for you. Maybe I'll just ask that question for you. For me, I think what creates hope is when, um, you know, one of my, my daughters are eight and four. If they're locked up in a room in an hour or two, there's usually an argument that it erupts or there's some kind of, you know, what do we do next? kind of turning to me. If they're outdoors, they could be gone for four hours. They'll only come back when they're hungry. So that's what gives me <laughs> that we are on the right track. <laughs> Along those lines, um, I mentioned how happy they are when they're outside. And I think that's what gives me hope, um, how little children, even older children, teenagers, still do appreciate the simplicity that nature brings, the peace that nature brings. When we're out and with the nature clubs, and there's so much diversity in the clubs also, which is really neat. Um, you see all walks of life, all different cultures and ethnicities. And Everybody's, you know, the kids, you don't hear arguing, you don't hear the tantrums, there's no crying, correct me if I'm wrong, but they get, you know, they get tired and you make, but you don't hear all that fuss um, when we're outside. It's just a lot more peaceful. I think, you know, similar thoughts, you know, but I was just, um, yesterday afternoon, I was up, we have a, a preserve up in, in the unincorporated area of Vista called our Anstein Audubon Nature Preserve. It's a little, 11 acre site, so it's a very small site, but it's kind of been transformed into this outdoor nature space. And, you know, our programs are a little different because we're a, a nonprofit and we're working with schools in the after school setting or even during the, the school day. It's not like a family club where we have families coming, you know, coming to us looking for that um, support, sense of support and togetherness and doing nature. Um, often we're serving kids, well, number one, the kids aren't choosing to do our, to, to be in our programs. Um, you know, they're being assigned by a teacher or an after-school administrator to come and do what they're doing. So we don't always have a 100%, you know, satisfied client at the beginning, <laughs> you know. Uh, some of them come and you can tell they're like dragging behind their, 
they're like way behind the other kids. Some of them are way up close near our naturalists. Others are dragging away behind. And um, seeing the, the incredible transformation that can actually happen with kids when you get them outside and they think, it's hot, this is going to be boring, I'd rather be on my phone or anywhere else but here. Um, that when you actually engage them, and it does take some skill to do that, as, as we all know, that they can be a totally different kid at the end of that, that time out of nature. That, th those transformations happen all the time. And so we just need to have the faith that, you know, we worry that people aren't with us. We just need to keep inviting people to be with us. Or, um, just another perspective. I, I, I was born in India, grew up there, came to the United States about 15 years ago to study and then stayed on. So I kind of want to offer the the perspective of having compared, you know, I, I grew up in a big city like Delhi. The amount of nature that in living in San Diego we have access to, the ease with which we can access that nature is unparalleled for many people who live on this earth with us. So, you know, we, we, we have all this bounty that we can choose to access and choose to teach our children to access. We're, we're already so far ahead in terms of, you know, what, what is given to us, the gifts that are already given to us, that um, we just have to kind of take the next step and, you know, nature's at our doorstep. I think in terms of empirical studies, uh, this remains one of the most understudied, most important issues I can think of. However, uh, one thing that gives me hope is that there are hundreds now of studies that have come out since Last Child came out, literally hundreds, and we have abstracts of over 300 of them on the Children Nature Network website that you can go and read for yourself. Uh, that, that are a testament to the benefits of nature for psychological health, physical health, the ability to learn, the ability to be creative. Um, that, that, that has been a change. That's been a big change. And it's, and it's accelerating, I think, that research. And it all points in the same direction. It, it, most of it has been correlated, not showing cause, but correlation. But it's very rare for, and, it's, and, and the reason for that is because nobody thought to ask these questions 30 years ago. So we took our relationship with nature for granted. And also because of blind spots in academia and in science. I don't have time to go into it, but it's changing. There's a lot more study. That's a, a big thing. And by the way, there was one study, two studies recently, of hundreds of schools in Massachusetts and Chicago that have shown the schools that green themselves I don't mean solar panels, I mean nature. The, the, and they factored out all the socioeconomic things. That those schools uh, do uh, impressively better on standardized test scores. Yeah. Um, in addition to the research, there's more and more uh, creation of nature preschools. You see that all over the country. You see lots of schools changing, not as fast as they should be in the public schools. But independent schools are off and running in this direction. Um, uh, you see these family nature clubs spreading everywhere. You see uh, there's at least 120 regional and statewide big campaigns in the United States that are, that are pulling people together in the same room that don't want to be in the same room ordinarily. There is something about this issue that brings conservatives and liberals together and developers and conservationists. I mean, nobody wants to be in the last generation where it's considered expected and normal for a kid to go out and dig a hole at the edge of the woods. Nobody wants to be in the last lane. And so it brings people together across religious barriers, across political barriers. That's incredibly cool. I can't name a single issue in America that does that other than this one. Uh, overseas, it seems, we're all seeing a lot of change. I just got, Kathy and I went to China for 10 days where I had a lot of speeches arranged for me. And it was, it was stunning. I had no clue why they were asking me to go there. And this issue has caught on there. And, and last
last child was in now two Chinese languages. And, um, and what one of the things the conservationists or the environmentalists there have figured out very quickly, in fact, quicker than the U.S. environmental organizations did, is that they don't they can't do as much as they want to about the terrible air pollution in Beijing and stuff, just by lecturing people. Or even talking about the adult self. What they can do is connect with people, particularly parents, about their one child. Because the one child policy is now a two child policy. Um, people there are even more afraid for the children than they are here. There's complex reasons for that. But many of the same trends are happening there. And so they've latched on, the environmental organizations have latched on to this issue. And not just to protect the kids from the toxins in the air, but to make sure that these kids have the benefits of nature to their psychological well-being, to their sense of, of reality, uh, to their sense of being fully alive. Uh, and finally, what gives me hope again and again is when I meet people like you, um, who, uh, you know, I'll be the first to admit that I have lots of moments of despair myself. Uh, but I decided a long time ago that there's no practical alternative to hope. <laughs> and it's a choice. It's a choice. And I see so many people around the country who are making that choice. And when I speak at colleges, in particular students, I can, I, I'll tell you, you know, when, when we talk about sustainability, about energy, you know, most Americans interpret that as energy efficiency, and it stops there. The students are very earnest, got to do that, extremely important, and their faces look like this. But when we start talking about, you know, what about something even broader and bigger than that? What about nature-rich homes and nature-rich schools and nature-rich cities? How about a nature-rich civilization? It's hard to imagine. It's hard to hang images on the word sustainability, but when you think about a nature-rich city, you can see that in your mind's eye. And suddenly their faces look like this. They want to do that. They want to go to that future. They want to help create that future. And Martin Luther King said and demonstrated in many ways that no movement, no culture, will survive if it cannot paint a picture of a world that people will want to go to. They want to go to the nature-rich world. Thank you, Rich. And no one ever wants to be the, the one to interrupt Rich Luke. <laughs> I have the honor this evening. Uh, once again, we are going to open it up now um, to questions. Um, Marla, would you mind setting up that mic over here? There are going to be two microphones. Um, we're only going to spend, Ron, if you can keep this all to about uh, 10 minutes. So we'll take as many questions as we can in those 10 minutes and just you know, wrap that up and move those people on. I know that um, people can introduce themselves and make one short and simple question, please. No monologues this evening. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Catherine Blake Spear. And, um, Thank you for having us all here today. It's such a, a great large crowd. Um, I actually am a member of the Encinitas City Council, and I'm running for to be the next mayor of Encinitas, so you might actually get somebody involved in your challenge. <laughs> and I, want, I wanted to ask you a question about a weighing of values. We recently had a very contentious discussion at our city about putting a bike path, a concrete bike path, in a rail corridor, and our rail corridor is unimproved, so it has lovely wildflowers and bluffs. And there were a lot of people who claimed public space for the value of, of open space that's undeveloped, and said, they had t-shirts that said, keep it natural. And so it was a very difficult decision whether to have a bike path, which is one value that I value highly, which is being able to get around our city biking and walking in an easier way since we're such a car culture, or keeping it in an undeveloped area for people who live nearby or come and park and can walk and walk their dogs and walk across to the beach. So I'm just wondering about your perspective on the importance of nature that we can drive to and experience in, in, in its vastness, or these little bits of nature here and there. And of course we all want to have it, have everything, but if you can't have everything, I just wonder if you have any perspective on, the, on that. 
Well, it's been really interesting working with the National League of Cities, which again represents 19,000 mayors and municipal officials. And they're struggling with exactly that, that kind of question among many others. Uh, and it's a three-year uh, uh, effort that we hope continues. The first year is to try to help define what a, a nature-rich city is, what does it look like? And many of the, one of the questions that you just asked, that question is part of that debate right now. The second year will be, how do you measure that over time in a city? And the third year is, how do you train future major mayors to do it and other city officials? Um, these aren't easy questions, and there's no glib answers that are useful. Uh, but uh, personally, I'm even more interested in nearby nature than I am in wilderness. Uh, wilderness, we have to protect every square inch of what we still have. But uh, cities, one of the precepts of the nature principle was that uh, conservation is no longer enough. Now we need to create nature. As strange as that sounds, and that's happening in many cities. Uh, uh, green roofs planted with uh, uh, native plants don't bring back butterfly migration rats. People changing their yards, as I mentioned. The idea of homegrown national park starting in your backyard, nothing in mind. Um, uh, when it comes to conflict between how people experience nature, that's a tough one. Uh, I often get questions about mountain bikers. <laughs> There's a lot of people that don't like mountain bikers. And, uh, but, you know, and in fact, uh, John Johns and I were on a, a hike one day. We were coming in, this is the Lagunas, I think. We were coming down a path, and there was a, uh, some mountain bikers, and they had stopped, and they were all excited because they just come upon a mountain lion stretched across the path. You know? And we stopped, and we were talking, we were having a great time, and then suddenly one of them stopped and, and pointed down at the mud and says, look at that, look at what people in, on horses are doing to this path. <laughs> <laughs> there was big holes for them. <laughs> I thought, why oh, isn't that a metaphor? I mean, um, and so I, I, I tried to avoid answers about hunting, fishing, um, mountain biking, all that, but I stopped doing that because I, I think what we need to focus on, and maybe this would be helpful in this case, is to look at each of these outdoor activities have some kind of core set of ethics, or they, at least they say they do. They often publish them. And to ask them to live up to those core ethics, I'd like us to look at the core ethics of mountain biking, and fishing, and hunting, and uh, all kinds of outdoor activities and come up with kind of a, the Ten Commandments of, of outdoor ethics uh, that, that are shared. And then really focus on that rather than you can't do that or you can't do that. I mean, personally, I think that one of those ethics should be is if the noise and the commotion I'm making outdoors is making it impossible for somebody else to use their senses in the outdoors, then I should stop doing it, or at least give it a break. Hi, my name is Erin. I work for the San Diego Zoo and the Education Department, and I'm a new parent myself. Yes, hi. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to ask, and you kind of touched on it a little bit, but. What exactly do you consider nature? Like, how much concrete is too much concrete? Is walking around the neighborhood good, or do I need to make the effort to go to Mission Trails, go to Marion Bear, those type of things? Yeah. Well, first, uh, and I hope the others ask the answer too. Uh, first, um, one of the antidotes, or one of the ways to deal with that question, is not only to focus on the nature that needs to be preserved, but to focus on the nature that can either be restored or created where there wasn't ever any real natural habitat. And we, I, I really believe that cities can become engines, or at least incubators, of biodiversity and human health, that we can do much more in our neighborhoods. And there's a lot of people working on this. You know, biophilic design uh, it is a new trend, biophilic architecture. There's ways that we can bring our cities alive with nature, where we live, work, learn, and play. Now, it's not wilderness.
but it will, it has many of the same effects on us, and it, it can increase the biodiversity of the region. Um, So in terms of what nature it is, both, I, didn't, I didn't try to get to that in the nature principle, but in last child and in the nature principle, I grabbed it a little bit. <coughs> this is one of the reasons there's not as much research as there should be on this issue, is because science has a blind spot. I worked with some neuroscientists for a few years. Some of the top neuro neuroscientists focused on, on the development of brain architecture in young children. And they were looking at all kinds of, of toxic stress and benefit and th good things in the environment and how it literally shapes the brain architecture of young brains. And, uh, you know, everything from parent-child attachment to how good is the preschool, is there violence in the neighborhood, is it peaceful in the <coughs> And they were using animal subjects. And they would stress out one group of pigeons over here and another one they would put in what they call the natural. When I would ask these scientists, have you ever thought about studying how the natural world shapes brain architecture in young children, they would look at me with a blank look on their face and say, what's nature? Uh, and I understand that they have a problem with that. There are at least 30 definitions of life in science. So I understand that, but I would say to the neuroscientists, this is a brain surgery. Come up with a hypothesis. <laughs> 150 trees per acre. I don't know, but you guys do this all the time. And the, irony, yeah, the irony was that they had, were already doing that in the lab with the control group. Yeah. But the minute you asked them to step out of the lab, they were lost. So there's this blind spot. The other reason for lack of research, by the way, is where the money comes from for research. Um, my, the definition. It's, there's no accident that we've left the definition of nature up to the poets. Um, and there's a lot of great poetic definitions of nature. Uh, uh, I think, for, for me, it's, it's wherever I'm in, whenever I'm in the presence and being affected by species other than my own. And that can be in my backyard, our backyard. That can be in the Cleobacus. That can be in Ansible. But it's here, it's all around us. One of the things that the Sierra Club did, did a good job at for a long time, they'd go into inner cities and put backpacks on kids and take them on a five mile hike in their own neighborhood and look for nature. And they always found it. You know, it's in, in the cracks of the sidewalks, it's in the alleyway, it's there if you look for it. And now we need to create more of it in our cities. Long answer. Thank you. My name is Laura Lees, and I work for local government and work for the county planning and development services. And we're currently preparing a climate action plan to address the sort of things that we're discussing here today. And we mentioned that family is our hope, and that's how we get kids engaged with nature. And I'd like to think of family as the smallest form of government. And so what gives me hope is seeing that the families are engaging their kids and I'd like to ask you to take it a step further and have your families and your kids help engage your local representatives in government to implement a plan that helps your communities look the way that you want them to be, um, to be nature-based. Um, and I just, this is sort of my call to action, I suppose, and I just wanted to say thank you and see if you have any comments about your participation in local <coughs> government in terms of nature. If family is the smallest form of government, I hope I'm not Donald Trump. <laughs> um, by the way, I've been talking about nature, and I'm sure there's somebody who likes Trump in here, I'm sorry. But, but, I, sometime, I've been talking recently about how natural play spaces, playground, natural playgrounds, uh, uh, kids are more likely to invent their own games, but they're also more likely to invite kids to play with them that don't look like them, and there's less, and the different gender, and there's less bullying on those kind of play spaces. So I've been recommending that Donald Trump spend more time on natural <laughs> play. Um, uh, uh, you know, just uh, a few months ago, uh, uh, saw us were asked to come to Chicago, where President Obama announced 
uh, I think four or five new nat nat national monuments. But he led by uh, announcing a new initiative out of the White House called Every Kid in the Park. And as of last September, some of you know this, as of last September, every fourth grader in America and that fourth grader's whole family gets a free pass for a whole year to any natural, nat national park or other federal lands or waters. And they're working with schools to, and corporations to raise money for buses to actually get the kids out there. And they're going to focus most of all on, on inner city schools. And um, I mean, I think that's a great thing that the government can do. Um, Sally Jewell, the head of the, the, uh, uh, the Interior Department, is very committed to this. She's the third Interior Department head in a row uh, that has been really on to this. And the first one was the Republic. Uh, and he was terrific. He was all over this. He cared deeply about it. So there's a lot that government can do, and, I, and there's a lot I can name. But I think most of all that happens at this level, at, 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 as I mentioned earlier, at the grassroots, because one reason is that we'll never have a government that does, that values the experience of nature unless those politicians know that there's a very big constituency out there that will watch their back. So you sort of just touched on um, the question that I had. So I'm a best he can and landscape architect. And I very much believe in designing spaces that bring nature into the everyday environments that we live, work, and play. And so San Diego um, and his state of the uh, city, Mayor Faulkner, launched his 50 parks in five years, some of these being new parks, refurbished parks, and joint use parks with schools. And I am just floored over and over that these meetings that keep happening, these joint use parks come down to two elements, fields, and maybe just fields, maybe it's just one element. And so it, it, there's just this, this idea that our community, you know, we're, we're overweight, we're obese, we have diabetes, and we need more sports fields, and it, all these meetings that keep saying, what about trees and nature play areas, and, and same with the school district, I'm trying to work it from all the angles to get the, the decision makers to understand the importance of these dynamic outdoor environments, and um, the woman from the county sort of started to address it, and I'm curious to know, Richard, whether you thought about it, or about what's happening locally with this, and anyone in this room who has any ideas of how we can really uh, have our decision makers understanding that it's not about liability and maintenance, but about health and healthy environments. So that's about it. I, I really like, you know, what the, the parks thing with Mayor Faulkner, and I really like the announcement that the goal of San Diego being, uh, uh, you know, all renewable energy. I can't remember the date the goal is, but I, I like that first in the nation. It's one of the reasons I think this is a prime city, <coughs> as is, uh, as are other cities in the county, to, <laughs> to uh, declare itself the, the finest city in America for children and nature. It's got to have a plan to do that. It's got to have a, develop a big constituency. It's got to have a regional campaign to do that. SB CAN has started that, but that has to be much, much bigger. Once you create that and are moving toward that in a goal, then those discussions about what to do with that land at least change a little bit. I mean, the playing fields will always, uh, maybe not always, but they're, and they're, and they're always going to be dominant for a lot of reasons, and I understand that. But you know what? The land around that playing field it can be terrific. There's a, there's a theory, and you probably know this, not, People, experts on creating parks, it's called the, the um, non-use syndrome, which is that you go to one of those flat fields when there aren't uh, soccer teams out there and they're empty, nobody's using it. Or now and then you see people, not very many. Where you will see kids and families uh, is at the edges of those parks. Uh, and there, you know, kids are turning over rocks and looking at the weeds. Why not see those as, uh, a, as part of the home ground national park, even if it's just the edges, to plant those with native species, to have community gardens surrounding them, to have a mix of those land uses in a, in a park. Um, it turns out also that 
the urban parks, the great study, urban parks with, that have the highest level of benefit to human psychological health are the urban parks with the highest biodiversity. And I have a theory about that, which is many of our pathologies as a species have to do with our arrogance that we think we can go it alone and that we are a lonely species. But when we look around in San Diego, it's everywhere. I mean, don't tell anybody that a ranger, uh, a, a, forest, a, a, park ranger, a park person at Penasquitos National, Penasquitos Canyon Park, told me there's a couple of mountain lions that live there. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> and, um, you know, when we look around San Diego, all the life in this city, it's amazing. If we begin to value that for our children's mental health, our mental health, and that we are not alone. We are not alone. And when we know that, when we encounter other species other than our own, we feel better, we feel more whole. Certainly our kids do. And our lives become more alive. Great. Thank you, Rich. We really appreciate this.